Okay, um, I just want to preface this talk by saying that this was very rushed. Uh, I was only added to the schedule on Wednesday, and the title there is for an older proposal. Um, and basically, this talk didn't exist a week ago, so I hope I can pull it off. Um, so who's Prekel Foundation? Uh, this is kind of our pitch. Um, yeah, we build open source scalable platforms that allow anyone to access vital information and services. Um, some important points here. Uh, well-being being a keyword, and palm of their hands. We're primarily focused on sort of mobile solutions um, to often to sort of like health problems. Um, yeah. So, what am I here to talk about? Basically, we're doing what I think is some pretty cool stuff with Mises and Marathon, actually in production. Um, we used Mises and Marathon, and we found we needed a bunch of other stuff as well to go along with it. Um, I'm going to talk about why we did this and what we found out along the way. Right, so our first kind of driving use case for this platform is our product called Universal Core. Um, it's a product for mobile websites. And they're, they're mostly like quite simple sort of CMS websites. Uh, we're a Python shop, so it's all Django-based stuff. Um, and we kind of needed to scale this platform a lot. We partner with a lot of different organizations. Um, one of them is Facebook for their free basics platform. Um, and we need to bring a lot of sites to a lot of different countries. Um, it's a lot of different variations. And our existing system of sort of just manually arranging processes uh, onto different machines in, in, in our puppet provisioning was not really scaling. Um, right, so what we built for this was basically sort of a smallish Mesos and Marathon cluster. Um, and we have each website running in a Docker container on this cluster. Uh, we're not really at, you know, like Twitter scale or whatever. We're not running thousands of nodes, but we have 10 hosts in a, in a South African data center. And uh, we kind of built a nice interface onto this, and we've done a lot of automation. And we're at the point where kind of product managers within our company can actually launch websites very quickly and easily. Um, right just to have a quick look at what this cluster looks like. Um, we use the terminology controller and worker. Mesos really uses master and slave. We kind of wanted to move away from that. Um, the controllers in this case are running uh, Mesos and Marathon, and the workers are running the Mesos slave process. And each of those little gray squares is basically a container. Um, and as you can see, we have some three controllers, so some kind of uh, room for one of them to fall over. You know, we achieved this sort of high availability functions of Mesos with that. And we have eight workers at the moment. I think we started with about four, and we've kind of been gradually adding them as we add new websites and need more capacity. Um, also, we kind of have some services which don't really run that well on Mesos yet, or we haven't figured out a way to do it, uh, especially things like databases. Uh, these sort of kind of just run on adjacent hosts in the cluster. Right, then the second use case, which is really the focus for our company at the moment, is a product called MomConnect. Uh, this launched in 2014, and uh, this started with the UK's, with the KZN Health Department, um, um, but it's since spread across the country, and uh, basically it's a service to connect pregnant women to the national health services, and we provide information and advice, and there's also some room for actually feedback between uh, patients and clinics, um, so there's, there's sort of like a feedback cycle, and sometimes we can get useful information, um, and actually affect some change. Uh, and there's been a lot of interest in this product, and we're sort of looking at moving it into new countries. Um, but... Moving to new countries is a little bit tricky with these sort of services, um, mainly because we can't just go and host it on Amazon or Microsoft or whoever because they don't have servers in the countries we're looking to deploy in. And we're going to be storing sensitive health information. Um, so there are issues of data sovereignty. Uh, seed is what we're calling our kind of collection of services that we do these sort of healthcare services with. Um, we primarily focus on maternal health, but there are other areas we're working with. Um, 
and we're kind of wanting to put this seed platform in lots of different countries. Um, one of the challenges here is, you know, we want to really scale our platform for impact, but we don't want to grow a giant team. We don't want to have to employ new people every time we go to a new country. Um, so kind of the idea here, which is, I think, quite ambitious, is to kind of build this thing up in a country and then hand it over to a local, a local partner, whether that be sort of national health services or an NGO or whatever. Um, right, so what I'm here to talk about today is what we're calling Seed Stack, which is kind of the infrastructure that myself and other people on the team have been building to host the Seed platform. Um, and it's kind of an evolution of what I showed you that we had for our universal core for just before it was just for hosting websites and now we kind of want a general architecture to host uh, microservices and build a larger system. Right, it has some kind of interesting requirements. Um, we have to coexist with unreliable infrastructure, you know, deploying in places like Nigeria and Uganda and these places, you know, maybe don't have reliable electricity or connectivity. Um, we need to make very efficient use of uh, limited resources. We don't have cloud, really. We can't just spin up new instances. Um, so we need to be very careful with how much we use. Um, we want it to be friendly to kind of whoever we hand it over to and for other people to use. And we want a really high level of automation so that you know, we don't have to worry too much about this thing once we've once we've put it in place. And we also want to be able to put it in place pretty quickly. Um, a kind of common platform for the things we're putting on this, these clusters is Docker. Docker is kind of great. If you haven't tried it, you should. You can basically just Docker run anything you like. Um, but that's not always that simple. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we had with this. Um, first of all, Docker processes are not really standard processes. You can't just manage them with, you know, upstart or system D or something, very simply at least. Um, they have new networking problems. You suddenly have kind of what looks a bit like lots of computers on one computer, um, and you have to connect them all up. Uh, then persistent storage is not that straightforward. Docker containers are pretty ephemeral. They, you know, once it stops, your storage is kind of gone unless you've mounted an external volume. Right, so we need some kind of orchestration system for this container, um, for these containers. And uh, this needs to achieve a few things. Uh, needs to allocate cluster resources efficiently. Um, it's gonna schedule these containers to run on whatever hosts we happen to put in the cluster. Um, needs to kind of monitor the containers, restart if they fall over. Um, ideally provide some kind of tools to make it easier to work with these you know, individual parts of the system. And we want some concept of sort of a highly available state of the world, state of the cluster. Uh, we don't really want to have to engineer a whole bunch of stuff for a distributed system because it's really difficult. Um, right, there are lots of sort of these, lots of platforms from various companies for doing these kind of things. Um, First two, of course, Mises Marathon you've heard of, and Kubernetes, Apache Aurora's Twitter scheduler that runs on Mises. Uh, then there's, of course, HashiCorp, which is building their own ecosystem on these things. There's the Docker company itself built a whole bunch of tools for this. Um, basically, there are a lot of things uh, and a lot to choose from. And different companies that are kind of trying to build ecosystems around Docker containers and getting people to buy into their product. Right, so the first thing I talked about that we need from a, from a cluster orchestration system is being able to allocate all the different resources. Um, like I said, we're using Mesos and Marathon, and as far as I'm concerned, we can manage compute with that fine. That is straightforward. We could, so long as we can say how much CPU and RAM the process needs, we can just tell me so as to do that and it's done. The other problems are a lot harder, I think. Um, networking, I'm gonna talk about quite a bit because I think there are a lot of problems there and a lot of different solutions. Storage, I'm gonna talk about a little bit because I think it's really difficult and we haven't quite got it figured out yet. Right, 
So container networking is primarily three things we want to do in the cluster. We want to route between all these different containers running on the different hosts, and we want to do this dynamically because you know, we don't really want to care where the containers are. They're just somewhere on the cluster. Um, and load balancing, we want to be able to load balance across multiple instances of the same container. And finally, service discovery. So how do the containers know where each other are if they need to connect to one another? Right. So I want to talk a little bit about Docker networking and kind of get a little bit low level. Um, the default Docker networking mode is called bridge networking. And essentially, in this mode, um, Docker puts your containers in this sort of subnet within the host. And uh, when you communicate with the containers, you talk via this virtual bridge interface, which is often known as Docker Zero. Um, and everything in Docker is basically built with standard parts of Linux. So in this case, uh, in the, we're forwarding port 8,000 on the host through to port 80 on container one. And all that happens, request comes in from the internet, IP tables goes, oh, this is for port 8,000, and then it basically just nats it to the address of the container on the host. Um, and then going the other way around, a similar thing basically happens. The, the connection comes out of the container, um, but the address for the container doesn't make any sense Kind of, it doesn't make any sense outside of the host itself, because this, is this is a local subnet. So the packet is uh, basically mangled by IP tables to say, hey, this actually comes from this host. Um, so basically what I'm trying to highlight here is that the containers don't really have IP addresses that you can access from anywhere else in the cluster, at least in Docker's default networking mode. All right, and I'm sort of Trying to put this problem under one name, which is IP per container problem. Um, you don't have to have an IP per container for, the, for these sort of things to work, but this is what I'm calling it. Um, but essentially, once we have container orchestration and a scheduler, we don't want to decide on the ports for things. We want, we want the containers to just dynamically be assigned ports, because otherwise, we're doing too much work. Um, but the problem is that you know, how do we know what port or container is on, and things are, certain protocols are just expected to be on certain ports. Um, so what you can do is put the address and the port in DNS, in your SOV records, but unfortunately not that many things actually query the ports from DNS, um, so this makes it tricky. What we really want is an IP address for each container so we can treat it just like another host. Right. There are lots of different solutions for this. Um, the first one, which is pretty popular, is to just kind of um, basically just tunnel through the cluster. Um, so packet encapsulation. Uh, so each packet is kind of encapsulated with extra information, and then a routing service on every node knows where to send things. Um, this, of course, sounds like it has a lot of overhead, which it potentially does, but thankfully people have been thinking about this for a long time, and there's native support in the Linux kernel for doing this kind of thing. Um, another solution is just to use standard IP routing. Um, this is pretty cool because it doesn't have as much overhead, but there's just a lot of management of routing tables you need to do. Um, and there are a few projects to do this. Uh, yeah, so just on the, on the first point on the virtual overlay networks, Docker added this functionality in quite a recent version, so you can actually get IP per container with plain Docker. Unfortunately, it doesn't play very well with Mesos or Kubernetes or these other systems. Right, then another solution, which was kind of touched, in, touched on in the, in the, the Mesos and Marathon talk, um, uh, is when we basically just have a router that can send requests to specific containers. So you could do this by having just a, you know, one node in the cluster is running a proxy or Nginx, and it knows where all the containers are, and it can recruit, it can root, rest, root requests um, to the correct containers. Um, another approach is to have like a router on every single host. Um, so for example, how this could work is container could 
to you know, get HTTP, um, read this container as the path or something, and then the router would send it off to the correct container. Um, this is kind of interesting because you can have sort of like um, client-side load balancing for things in a way. Um, yeah. And then there are certain solutions you have where you, if you're using AWS, you can use some of the features of like VPCs, um, and there are equivalent things for other providers. Uh, right. So onto service discovery. This can basically be summarized as, you know, give me the address for service X. And there are various ways of doing this. Um, the first one is you have an API that knows where things are. Um, this will require you to actually change something in your app to query that API. Uh, then there's DNS. Like I mentioned before, you need the SRV records to get ports. And then there are questions of, uh, you know, what do you set your time to live value to because you have these containers that you know, may just go out of existence pretty quickly. Um, then, uh, again, with the routing, that kind of works around this problem um, and routes the correct table. Roots to the correct container, um, but it kind of limits what protocols you can use because the router has to speak the protocol for it to work. Um, and yeah, overall, ideally, you don't want to have to change your app. You just want to change just the configuration. Right. Um, I just want to talk a bit about console. Uh, this is a product from HashiCorp. Um, you may have heard of it, and we're using it uh, basically does a bunch of things that make service discovery a lot easier. It has DNS, has an API, has a key value store, it does health checks on things. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty useful and you can, you have these like local addresses for things. Um, uh, so anything with like service.console will be your internal address. Um, it does health checks and it, you know, if something falls over, it spreads that information very quickly using this fancy gossip protocol. Um, and there are other tools that go along with it, such as console template, um, which make it very easy to template the configuration for things based on the state of the world in console. So you can template the configuration for Nginx or Hyproxy and get it to reload automatically. Right, but we kind of have these two worlds of Mesosphere Marathon and HashiCorp console, and these things are not really built to work together. So we built this little Python tool, which we call Consular, which is the little red circle in this, in this diagram. Um, it basically just syncs the state between Marathon and console. So it listens for events from Marathon and updates console with service information. Uh, then we use console template, which generates the, the configuration for Nginx which produces a load balancer or router config. Um, right, finally, onto storage. I'll try and get through this quickly. Um, there are a bunch of different ways to do this, and they're all quite difficult. Um, so you could use a network file system um, that you know, has, a, has pros and cons. Um, it, you could have a very large cluster with lots of storage space and lots of redundancy and these sort of things, but then, you know, there are questions of performance, you know, how fast your disks and your network connections. Um, yeah, and Docker recently added a API, so you can basically tie all kinds of things into Docker to become volumes for your containers. Um, it's quite a recent API, so they may not be an adapter from your storage system to your containers yet. Um, but yeah. And there are a couple of other projects, uh, Flocker and Sheepdog. And it's kind of this sheep herding metaphor, <laughs> quite common, um, which basically just move data around with your containers. So your container dies on one node, comes up on another one, and Flocker will move the volume there. Um, but these tend to work a lot better when you have something like EBS, which you can just quickly connect over to different hosts. Um, and yeah, it really helps if you have like a cloud provider that has a good network storage solution. Um, so just to summarize what we picked, Mesos and Marathon. Um, been meaning to try some other things that run on top of Mesos, but we haven't got around to it yet, but 
Marathon works great. Um, we've got console service discovery, and then we're using Nginx to root and load balance. We looked at a proxy, but it's a little bit more difficult to get it to uh, reload smoothly. Uh, then we're using GlusterFS for storage, mostly because we had previous experience with it in our organization. Um, then we built a kind of custom front end for launching apps on this platform, because Marathon was not quite the right level of abstraction that we wanted. Um, then we have a bunch of shared services still that run on kind of adjacent nodes in the cluster. So what works well? We really like Mesos and Marathon. Um, stuff just runs really easily, uh, and we're making much, much better of our much, much better use of our resources. Um, and we've been kind of just adding nodes to scale, which has been pretty painless. Um, also, occasionally a node has fallen over, and you know, the containers just get moved to another worker, which works great. Um, and yeah, we've achieved what I think is a reasonably high level of automation. I don't think every application quite fits on this stack yet, so that's why I've got kind of for most cases in bracket. Okay, so things that haven't aren't quite there yet. We don't yet have IP per container, and we really <laughs> want this and we make life a lot easier. Um, we don't think any of the existing solutions quite uh, integrate with Mesos and Marathon really that well yet. Um, also, between Marathon and Console, there's a little bit of duplicated functionality. Things like health checks are in both of them. Um, and sometimes syncing the state between two systems that don't have the same sort of like data model can be a bit tricky. Um, also, templated configuration is great, but like if you can enter arbitrary strings into your Nginx config, you can just serve random files and these kind of things. Um, and we want to move more of our infrastructure into containers. There's still quite a few things that we, we haven't, you know, we don't have running on Mesos yet, and we're kind of having to manually place on hosts, which we don't want to do. Um, and yeah, there's still just a lot of auxiliary services. Uh, there's, like, you know, there's databases, and then you want logging systems, you need a time store database, and you messaging service, you need RabbitMQ, and we keep kind of having these things that we can't put on the cluster yet. Um, so we're still working on that. And what are we looking forward to? Um, I've been kind of watching all the Mesosphere repos on GitHub very carefully, and you know there are people working on these IP per container things, and we're really looking forward to that. We need to do still a lot of work on our sort of logging, monitoring, and these sort of things within the cluster. Um, one thing I'm really interested in looking at is services to kind of share secrets and certificates between nodes in the cluster. Um, HashiCorp has a product called Vault, which looks really interesting for that. Also, basically, <laughs> ask us how this went in six months, you know, and once we've done two deployments, we're doing Nigeria at the moment and Uganda soon, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, yeah, I think that's about that. Thanks. Cool. Any questions? Hi. Hi. Um, with the using Hi. of <laughs> oh. with um, using uh, GlusterFS for stateful containers, um, have you had any issues with the latency in actually persisting stuff? And let's say the host, along with the container, dies at the same time. Um, that kind of data loss issues. Have you run into it? And uh, not really. We've, uh, we've mostly tried to really restrict how much we're using it yet, so we don't have that much experience yet. Um, we've mostly been trying to keep things in just using like Postgres. And we have a couple of things using Gluster, and it hasn't been a problem yet. But we're, yeah, we're cautious of that. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Uh, what I would like to know is, uh, can you run a Docker inside another Docker, like have a nested uh, Dockers? Uh, yes, you can. Um, probably shouldn't. You have to. <laughs> you have to run the, the the host container in what's called privileged mode, which means it can do all kinds of things on the host system, um, and then you can run a container inside of it. But yeah, you need a 
use case for that to justify it. Anyway. Yeah. Hi, great talk. Um, question, if you're gonna hand this over to someone, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you plan to make things like Mesos and Marathon and Docker and HashiCorp Vault and Console and everything else a package you can hand to someone and give them a, you know, the missing manual that's that's not like incredibly long. Like, what's what's your yeah. overall? How are you going to hand this to somebody? Plan. Okay. Well, there's sort of different sides to it. Um, firstly, you can <laughs> go see our GitHub repo. Everything we have is basically open source. We've worked on a lot of tools for provisioning this. Um, we use um, Puppet to do that, uh, and you can try it out on a VM at that that repo address. Um, yeah, we, we still need to do quite a lot on documentation. Um, we're working on it. Uh, <laughs> um, we do have a sort of uh, UI front end, which I, I didn't really have much time to talk about. We're building something we're calling mission control at the moment, which will uh, sort of tie together lots of different things. So you'll be able to launch containers and then together with that, uh, define the resources such as databases that need to work with those containers. Yeah. Uh, I guess this is a question that would probably be better directed as the, at the Mesos guys, but since you are looking for an IP per container solution, I noticed that you also considered VXLAN, but then that kind of puts requirements on configuration uh, like for your routers to support that. So instead, did you consider replacing the Docker bridge with, say, Open vSwitch? Um, well, <laughs> uh, to be honest, I, yeah, I don't know that well about that much about all these <laughs> different networking standards. Um, so I know that there's a project called Weave, which does very similar sort of packet encapsulation stuff. And for certain data paths, in Weave, they are using Open vSwitch. Um, I just use VXLAN as an example because it's supported by uh, Chorus Flannel as well as um, the actual Docker native, um, uh, Docker native virtual overlay network uses VXLAN as well. So, yeah, I don't know if that <laughs> helps. <laughs> 